So first of all, thank you, Beck, for that very generous introduction. And I'd like to thank the department for having me here. It's been wonderful. It's a beautiful campus, and it's the first time I'm getting a chance to come to St. Louis and to the state of Missouri. So thank you all very much. So as he said, I'm Venkat. I'm a research staff at Oak Ridge National Lab. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my research there. Now, before I begin, I'll just say that in this talk, uh, how many of you are students? Can you please raise your hands? OK, good. So one thing I want to do is also introduce what tell you something about Oak Ridge and what the opportunities are. Because you know, five or six years back, I was a student also. And I don't think I had as much idea about what happens in a national lab. Because I think a lot of times people understand academia. You know what life like is in industry. So I'll just give you a few, a few highlight slides before we dive into you know, research topics for today. So Oak Ridge National Lab, it's a Department of Energy National Lab, which was started during World War II. As it was one of the sites of the Manhattan Project. And we are about 45. 100 staff members, of which about 50% are researchers, that is research staff. And in, you know, in present day Oak Ridge is managed by the Department of Energy's Office of Science. So it does you know, research in six core areas, advanced materials, clean energy, so things like biofuels, developing new biofuels. They work on national security missions. The lab also has a very rich history in neutron and nuclear science, because that's where it began from, as, as you know, doing a lot of work with neutrons and nuclear science. So that still is one of the core research areas in the lab. And then there's supercomputing. So in support of these missions, there are big user facilities. So us, Oak Ridge, and other sister Department of Energy labs often have very specific, specialized user facilities that, we, that, is, that they built to do research. So one of that, what you're seeing on the top, is called the High Flux Isotope Reactor. So it is the world's highest flux research nuclear reactor. So what, what can you do with such a reactor? One of the newest elements that has been discovered is actually called tennessine. So you make you know, isotopes which enable discovery of new elements using such a reactor. Uh, such a reactor also provides fuel, for example, for deep space missions. So if you look at the Cassini probes which are sent deep space, they, they have something called a radiothermal generator, which is a, which is a plutonium fuel which, which powers this probe to go into deep space missions, because that's the only way you can generate so much power for so long. Right? So that comes out of materials, that, that, that comes out of uh, the hyper, as it's called. There's also, Oak Ridge is also home to supercomputers. So the world's fastest supercomputer is at Oak Ridge National Lab. It was built as a collaboration between Oak Ridge and IBM and NVIDIA. And it has 27,648 GPUs. So you can, do, you, can, you can imagine, you can think big. And this is a user facility. So anyone can write a proposal. And if it's big enough, it's a, it's a good proposal, you can write a proposal to utilize this supercomputer. So it's a, it's a service that is provided right, to the research community at large. Another major area, another facility is called the Manufacturing Demonstration Facility. So manufacturing is a very major theme of research right now. So to, to advance US manufacturing is a big theme of research at the lab. And the MDF is the Manufacturing Demonstration Facility, which pioneers research in all type, all aspects of manufacturing. So one of the, you know, one of the showcase items was they print large objects. So they, they 3D printed a car, the Shelby Cobra, a, a few years back. And they're, they're really looking at you know, 3D printing large, large objects. So, these are just a flavor of the kind of facilities that help doing research in these areas. So today, I, I am an electrical engineer with a signal processing background. So how does that fit into this bigger theme? So we work in a group called the Imaging Signals and Machine Learning Group. There are about 15 of us. And we are a functional group that supports research in all those areas. So it's a group that builds imaging systems uh, from scratch. It does work on using existing imaging systems and improving them by the design of algorithms. Or it also does work in using you know, off-the-shelf imagers in order to perform certain tasks. So that could be image analysis type work. So some example projects are, they deserve, you know, we designed a, a, a microscope to do semiconductor wafer in, inspection based on a holographic system. So this is an older project, but still highlights what, you know, this, this involves starting from, you know, putting together the system and then coming up with the algorithms to do 3D imaging. Uh, more recently, there's been work on a planoptic, like, uh, a multi-camera imager. So this is used, for example, for portal monitoring applications. So how can you look through a windshield and identify human drivers 
that are inside. So that's, that's another imaging system that was developed in-house. We've also worked with neutron imaging. So you saw the high flux isotope reactor. So one of the things that, that it can do is do imaging, just like how you might do CT. With medical, you can do CT and imaging with neutrons. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. But there was a project on how do you improve the resolution of the imaging beam line by using coded apertures. And that, again, is an inverse problem. And so putting that system together. There's also some work on uh, looking at thermal imagers to do building occupancy monitoring while maintaining privacy. So using coarse, very low resolution imagers inside buildings, putting that system together, and being able to control the HVAC systems. We are also a signal processing group, so there is some work going on in doing seismic monitoring. So we have a couple of staff members working on, si on, on seismic, which includes seismic imaging and also monitoring seismic signals. So for example, this is a little project where they're looking at, a, you know, at seismoacoustic sensors placed outside a facility. And by looking at the signatures, can you classify what is the state of the, of the operations of, for example, for the reactor? Is it on? Is it off? Is it safely operating by doing signal analysis? And this I briefly talked about was basically you have a multi-camera system, so you can start doing through windshield. You can get away. You can design algorithms to look to, to kind of do away the glare. They also, so the work group also does traditional computer vision. So using computer vision tools to build systems, right? So vehicle detection for, uh, to kind of, uh, to control traffic flows better so that we can improve efficiency instead of having a big truck stop at a light every time if there was some a smarter way to just let it through. So coming up with the algorithms for that is an example of another project. So all this was just to give you a flavor of what happens you know, in, in the imaging signals and machine learning group, especially from, from the student's perspective. If, you know, if this is something that, that is of interest to you, you should look us up uh, for opportunities. Now, so we'll dive in one more layer further. My own work in this, in the, in the set, in the subset, is in the field of computational imaging. So computational imaging is a name given, you know, it's a field which just says, it's a field that goes if, for systems that go from measurements to reconstruction. So these days, most imagers involve a significant aspect of computation, right? So if you take your cell phone out and click a picture, it's not just all the photons that f you know, fell on the sensor are just displayed. There's a lot of computation that goes on. And if you look at even the latest iPhone, it has three cameras, right? So computational imaging is a very, you know, very important and fundamental field. It's a growing field. And as far as Oak Ridge is concerned, where does computational imaging coming? So it comes across the length scales of imaging. So we have electron microscopes that, we, that people build in the lab. So for example, this is a little project where if you want to speed up the scan, if you have a scanning electron microscope, there are three ways to accelerate the scan. So because maybe you don't want to damage samples. So one way is to just acquire quicker, you know, acquire each point quickly so you get more noise. You might be able to do a low resolution image and then super resolve it, design an algorithm to super resolve. This is image super resolution. You might skip samples and do sparse reconstruction. That is, this picture has a lot of missing pixels. So how do you fill in? So those are three ways to kind of speed that process up. We also do X-ray CT. So where we, you know, how many of you know what is computer tomography? Okay, so that's a fair number, right? So it's a CT scan. So you make measurements of as an object which is, you know, by rotating it, you collect a bunch of projection images, and then you design algorithms to produce three-dimensional volumes. So you can do volumetric imaging, which is foundational to being able to look at the quality of additively manufactured parts, for example. I briefly talked about coded aperture neutron imaging. So again, you make a measurement, and then you process it with an algorithm to produce a high-resolution image, in this case of a screw. So what you're seeing are the threads of the screw. We also work on uh, ultrasound imaging for, in order to evaluate thick, to, to be able to look inside thick concrete walls, for example, for nuclear power plant applications, where you can only access the wall from one side. So you put, you have an ultrasound system, you make measurements, and then you're able to process them using algorithms to do 3D imaging. So, so our computational imaging plays a foundational role across the length scales, right? And so this is going to be the topic of today's talk. It's going to be about designing these algorithms for various systems. So why is, what are the big, if I just abstract away, what are the challenges when you think about computational imaging design? The first thing is you're very often dealing with complicated physical models. So the interaction between an x-ray and a sample you know, produces the image on the detector. That interaction can be complicated to models. The physics can be complicated. So if you want to go backwards from measurement to reconstruction, you have to deal with that complexity. 
very often you're dealing with imperfect, noisy in instruments with limited time for use. As I said, some of these instruments are shared facilities. So it's critical that we make the measurements quickly. So any way we can accelerate the measurement is great. And I argue that we can do that algorithmically. Make fewer measurements and then you know, come up with more complicated algorithms which you can design. Of, and that can help optimize the use of the instrument, which, as I said, is a shared thing. Many people are using these highly specialized instruments. And finally, we're dealing with large data sets. So many scientific data sets, we are dealing with large data sets. So for example, when you do 3D imaging, it is very typical to have a 2K by 2K by 2K volume. So you have to be able to produce these images in reasonable amounts of time so that people can use the algorithms at the end of the day. So these are the big challenges if I just abstract at least as far as you know, for, for many of the applications that I'm talking about. And therefore, there is a need for algorithms. So this talk is going to dive into some aspects of, the, of these challenges. So if I, if I again look back, step back and look at what, are, you know, what has been done so far right? in, in the past, you know, many of these systems exist, and they use some baseline techniques. So at, at the end of the day, for all computational imaging, you're looking at solving an inverse problem. You have a 3D thing you want to measure. You have a physical system, and it produces noisy data. And we have to go backwards from data to we have to estimate the reconstruction. So the first kind of wave of computational imaging was based on analytic techniques. You can write out a formula for the measurement to go from the measurements to the reconstruction. I'm hand waving a little bit, but let's just say you can. You can write, and so many systems implemented these. These are fast, so most CT scanners, if you go for a medical CT, implement an algorithm which you, know, you can quickly compute. So these are nice, they're simple, fast. They may have properties which can be well understood. But when you start trying to push the number of, you know, reduce the number of measurements, lower the dose, and you have very noisy measurements, these techniques are not the best. They're not very applicable in that case. So the next wave of techniques, I like to call them model-based image reconstruction. And it was, I mean, I'm sure multiple people used it, but you know, my, my, when I was in grad school, my advisor often used this word called model-based image reconstruction. And those use the tools of statistics, right? Because you're dealing with a noisy data set, and you want to estimate something. So, there are several statistical estimators. You, so there are maximum likelihood estimators. There are map estimators. So, there are, so the tools of statistics have dealt with how to do this in, at a high level. And essentially, when you, a popular estimator is called the map estimator. And it essentially reduces the reconstruction to minimizing a cost function with two set of terms. The first one enforces fidelity. So give me a reconstruction that matches the data in some sense. So this encodes that. So it encodes the physics and the noise statistics of the data. And the second, time is a, second term is a regularizer that enforces some, a model for the unknown object itself. So if you, ha, you know, if you look at an image, let's say a 100 by 100 image. So each, that is, each of the, and let's say each pixel can take on 256 values. The space of image, real world, realistic images is very small compared to all possibilities of this matrix, right? So this kind of helps enforce that constraint in some, and, and so these techniques, uh, which I think encompass both, I, I would say if you don't have a regularizer, it's maximum likelihood. These, these techniques are a very useful way of uh, computational imaging system uh, algorithm design, because they can start modeling complicated physics. They can work with these high noise and sparse, you know, when you try reducing the number of measurements, these kind of techniques can be very useful. But they can be time consuming, and they can also lead to artifacts when you have a lot of model mismatch. If you cannot write these terms out reasonably, you can start getting. But in this talk, we're going to focus mainly on these set of techniques. And I'll show you why they can be useful. And, how, and we'll go into the nuts and bolts of how, a few examples of how to design such, a, such techniques for real world systems. So today's talk, I'll talk about model-based image reconstruction techniques. I'll, I'll show you and I'll give you an example of, time, of, an example of time of flight neutron tomography. And I'll go in, I'll tell you what all that means. And then I'll just, if I have time, we'll briefly blaze through a bunch of other applications that we have developed these model-based techniques for. The second part of the talk will focus on the regularization. That is, what are effective ways to model an image? So this will be, we'll look at one class of techniques called convolutional dictionary regularizers. And I'll brief, I'll end the, end the talk with, you know, uh, with some efforts on using deep learning assisted reconstruction. And this is preliminary work, but I'll, I'll round the talk off that way. Okay. So let's start with the first topic for today, which is type neutron tomography. So why neutrons? I just, you know, I came here, I spoke about Oak Ridge having neutrons. So why care about neutrons itself? Because X-rays are, you know, easy, many of, they are easy to generate compared to that, and they're available. 
Oak Ridge, as I said, has two facilities which generates neutrons. One is the reactor, and the other one is called the spallation neutron source, which is based on accelerating a proton beam. It collides with a mercury target and spalls, and that produces neutrons. So it's different from a reactor, and this can produce time of flight. I mean, this can produce a wavelength resolved, you know, a, a, a neutron beam with a spectrum. So why I care about neutrons is because they can provide a complementary contrast to X-rays. So what you're looking here at here is a, new, a Buddha statue imaged using <coughs> neutrons and X-rays. On the left, what you see is X-rays, and on the right is a neutron image. And you can see the images look different. So can anyone guess what the center thing is? Why, why are you seeing this here and not here? So the reason is neutrons are actually sensitive to lighter elements, like hydrogen and carbon. So this is strange, because in X-rays, a light element doesn't block the X-ray. Whereas neutron, water is used as a moderator. So it tells you that what, you know, it Organic material can attenuate neutrons, but not X-rays. So in this case, you can see that this was used as a reinforcement of some sort to build the statue. So that is why neutrons are useful. They provide complementary contrast to X-rays. So they behave very differently compared to X-rays. They can penetrate heavy elements. So you can take a block of lead, and neutrons can shoot right through it, whereas X-rays cannot. Right? X-rays, you start having a metal object you, they can start doing strange things like scattering. That's why they ask you to remove your laptop out in, and not let you keep it in your backpack when you put it in the airport scanner. So, and, and finally, neutrons are sensitive to hydrogen. So that's, that's the kind of application areas where neutrons shine. When you want to look at hydrogen, for example, water transport in plants, you want to look at heavy elements or just metals. You want to look at metals which are often used for you know, engineering applications, like you want to make a jet engine turbine that's made out of metal. So that's the use of neutrons. But we're going to look at hyperspectral neutrons. So as I said, the spallation neutron source is a source which can produce a new, an input spectrum. And if you contrast it with techniques that do not look at the spectrum, if I take a block of metal and look at it in a, in a neutron source which is not energy resolved, you get an image like this. And that image you know, it doesn't tell you much. But on the other hand, if I have a neutron beam and a detector which can discriminate energy, you can start looking at the image at every energy, and that looks very different. So in this case, the engineers had engineered a, a sample with the letters DOE for the Department of Energy, and they had this to have a certain crystal structure, which you just cannot see with, without this wavelength resolved measurement. So by having a time of flight uh, instrument or wavelength resolved instrument, you can start seeing images at every wavelength. Downside? Yes. Slow down? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. So they, they often have like a moderator stage, and then, and that, that's right. Yes, that's a good question. Yeah. So, so that's the application. So now, can, and the reason this, this kind of contrast difference happens is because this material is crystalline, right? And you get brads, you get scattering from these points. So that's the benefit of using time of light neutrons. But there are challenges in using this technique to do CT or tomography. So, uh, in terms of applications itself, there are two applications whenever people look at most hyperspectral app, you know, imaging. One of it is chemical mapping. So different elements, if you, if you, if you put a sample in and look at, you know, on a, look at it on a detector, and if you have a time of wavelength resolved measurement, the signature will be different for different chemicals. So that is one reason why people use time of flight or wavelength resolved measurement. The other one is to look at, at metals, which are especially crystalline. Because if you have a crystal, uh, you know, it, it'll, and you have a new incident neutron beam, it'll scatter away the beam depending upon Bragg's law. So whenever n lambda is 2d sine theta, where d is the crystallographic spacing, uh, a scattering event occurs. And so that can help, to, but you can start thinking of using this type of an instrument to look at crystalline materials. So those are the two big application areas that, you know, that we're thinking about while thinking about uh, time of flight neutrons. And this is a, a beam line or an instrument that is being commissioned at Oak Ridge. So it's not yet built. So in order to understand the challenge of doing, you know, studying crystalline samples with neutrons, we need to have just a high level overview of what, what it means to have a single crystal. So if you have a, a, an object and you look at one small region, and if that region is a perfect single crystal, and you measure the neutron transmission as a function of wavelength of just, just a small block, you can see that at certain orientations, the attenuate, the transmission just drops. Because what happens is the, is the beam goes through, 
And because some part of it is crystalline, it just gets, you basically have, uh, you know, drag diffraction. And then you get a drop in the beam that goes right through because some of it is just scattered either back or at some angle away. So this is what happens when you stick a single crystal in. If it has some texture, which means if it's not a perfect single crystal, you get something like this but with broader peaks. Whereas if you look at a powder, which, which basically means the, each of these sub-regions of this little region is oriented with a different crystal orientation, you get a pattern which looks very different. So usually when people do CT you know, for tomography, they're often dealing with samples whose attenuation profile looks like this and not like this, though this can be important. So to understand the challenge of doing computed tomography with single crystal samples, let's look at how the, how the attenuation changes as a function of wavelength when the, a single object is going to be rotated in a neutron beam. So what you're looking at is a simulation. And this, was de this is some, so we've developed some code, uh, we meaning our group, has developed some code for doing neutron transmission simulation. So if you take a block of, single, of a powder and rotate it and plot the attenuation as a function of wavelength for different rotation angles, you can see that this number doesn't change as a function of angle. That's typical. So that is very typical for most X-ray CT applications, not just for neutrons, even for X-rays. But if you take a pure, sing a pure a single crystal and do the rotation, then the attenuation is going to suddenly change as of at certain wavelengths and angles because Bragg's law gets satisfied. So what happens is, you know, doing computed tomography of samples containing single crystals is much more difficult because if you plot how the attenuation changes as a function of angle, let's just take one wavelength. So if a neutron beam, many energies, pick one wavelength and look at how the attenuation changes. You can see at some angles, you get a big spike. It's only a few of the angles, but you get a big spike. So this messes up the signal that you receive when you have a single crystal, a, a CT of a single crystal. So how do we deal with this challenge is what this, this part of the talk is going to address. So one challenge, as we saw, the attenuation is a function of the rotation angle of a, of a subregion. So it breaks some of the fundamental assumptions that we use. The second thing is that you may have a low neutron flux. So unlike in X-ray tomography, neutron acquisition can take a long time. It's a pretty niche application. So it can take probably an hour to get one hyperspectral image. Just, I'm just making a number up. You know, it all depends on the sample. But that's not so if you And then if you want to acquire two, you know, 50 angles, that's 50 hours of experiment time. And the flux tends to be pretty bad. So what you're seeing is a, a, a 3D sample. This has been simulated using, uh, you know, using a realistic noise levels. And you can see it's pretty noisy. And, and, and similarly, if I take the same object and now do a CT of it, uh, you, I'm sorry. Yeah, so what you're seeing is a CT scan of this part, a simulated scan. So this is the measurement. So at some angles, you'll see it lights up because the crystals were just oriented right, and you see a big scatter away. And so the transmission sees a big drop. So the question is, how do we go from here to get the 3D object back? So that's what this part is going to be about. So uh, the, the main idea that we've come up with is to say that we can do a reconstruction out of it. So the main challenge would be to go back to the data sets and look at regions which contain these single crystal, I would call them, you know, uh, mismatches. So this is something that's unexpected. That the, the, the attenuation suddenly changed, and it resulted in the measurement changing in a certain way. So if you can design a method that can fi find out those regions which were due to Bragg scatter, you can kind of leave them out and do a reconstruction, and also find a map of the actual data which you didn't use or you threw out because of Bragg scatter. And then you can design a mapping algorithm after that to get some extra information. So along with the CT scan, you can get some information about how each of these domains changed as a function of uh, angle. You can get some crystallographic signature. So that is our our, our proposed idea. So I'll go into some details now of how we do the CTV tomographic reconstructions when you have data corrupted, not corrupted, but affected by Bragg scatter. So the main idea is to again think about the model based reconstruction framework, and we're going to come up with a new fit, data fitting model here to be handle the fact that some of the measurements were affected by Bragg scatter. So the main idea here is that we're going to design a method that takes the noisy data, it's going to have some uh, parameter which controls which measurements were bad and then come up with a reconstruction. And that's the cost function that we have designed is a sum over all the measurements of some penalty, which I call the Hubert-like penalty, applied to each measurement. And this is the model. It says that it's a, it's a, it's a projection of the 3D volume. So F is the unknown thing you want to estimate. A is a projector. It just adds the numbers up. And it says, I want the F that 
lowers this discrepancy. And we have a waiting term here. And we apply a, 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 a function which is quadratic at a certain point, and then it clips because it helps to break away essentially the bad measurement. So that's our forward mod that's our model-based reconstruction cost function that we need to optimize over in order to get a, high, a, a 3D reconstruction. And S of S is just a standard edge-preserving regularizer. So now we have a function which is non-convex, and we need to find a way to optimize this. So the way we're going to do that is using a, the approach of surrogate functions or majorization. So majorization means you essentially have a complicated function. You start off with an initial guess, build a simpler function, q sub x, and you lower the if you minimize that, you ensure that you lower the value of the original cost. If you keep repeating, it guarantees a sequence of decreasing costs. So that's going to be the approach. So we're going to design a surrogate to our cost function. To do that, we look at the penalty term itself. And in, so we had a penalty term which was like this. So we can show that, that we can build a surrogate function which is quadratic when the initial guess is inside the region, inside the quadratic region. And it's a flat region when it's outside. So we can show that this is a surrogate function to the one term of the cost. And you can go ahead and replace every term in the cost function with this, with this quadratic surrogate. Uh, and you get a new function that you can then, if you minimize this, you'll guarantee you move to a lower value of the original cost. And it turns out one of the cool things is that we've essentially turned a complicated non-convex function to a sequence of simpler convex functions. And it, it has a nice interpretation. It essentially says, OK, I have this data which, is, which has some some, some, uh, you know, some effects that I don't model very well. So what I'll do is at every iteration, I'll start with a, somehow I start with a guess for the 3D volume. I project it. I find the difference between the measurement and my prediction. And those areas where the error, I'm not able to fit it very well. In the next iteration, I just kind of leave, I drop those measurements out. Is the, you know, the English, whatever, the, 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 the algorithm in words. But essentially, that's what it does. And you can keep repeating this, construct a surrogate, lower it. And at the end of it, you get a reconstruction and a map of measurements that were rejected out. So uh, once you build that, you can then use any uh, you know, technique to optimize some of the, the inner thing. I've used a standard method from the literature, so I'll say so it's based on a gradient, taking a gradient, and just taking a step with some acceleration. So once you get the reconstruction, then you can uh, segment it. You can get a hyperspectral reconstruction, do a connected component, segment the components, and then correlate each of the components with identified the measurements identified as anomalous, and then you can get this crystalline signature also. Let's look at some results now. So if I look at a simulated noisy data set and I apply a standard technique based on you know, the analytic inversion, you can get a lot of noise in the reconstructions. Whereas with these model-based approaches, you can get significant improvements in the reconstruction quality because it can, it's a nice trade-off between noise and resolution, which you cannot get with the standard techniques for just noisy data. When you have single crystal data with the, with the with the flashes occurring due to Bragg scatter, like over here, along with the noise, that, that's an additional layer of complexity. And then the proposed algorithm can still obtain a 3D reconstruction compared to uh, the existing technique. So you can see what you're seeing is the reconstruction. And you can also see a map. So it goes to the original measurements and also tell you which measurements were left out finally at the end of all the iterations. So you get two pieces of information out of this. And it shows you can do tomography even for single crystal materials. And this is an example of the crystalline signature. So this was the ground truth, and this is what was obtained by the algorithm. So it does a pretty good job of identifying when this component went into the Bragg condition. And we have done this on other simulated data sets also, where again, we have data like this, and the goal is to do a 3D reconstruction. And again, compared to the existing techniques, we can get a pretty significant improvement. And you know, these are hyperspectral. What you're seeing is the answer at one wavelength, and you can plot for example, the, the pixel values as a function of wavelength. And again, compared to the existing technique, which is here, we can get a much better answer with the blue is the model based and green is the ground truth. So we can really get something out of such data sets. And you can, you know, this is a 3D rendering of the 3D of the volume and along with the crystalline signatures of these, crystal, of these domains. Yes. Can I ask you on the last slide quickly? Yeah. Uh, the two on the top right, so the top right, that's correct from the Bragg scatter? This one, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it was just, just, so it's really not very applicable to, you know, this, I just pumped the data into an algorithm which like filtered back projection, which is not very effective, right? Uh, and so, yeah, and you can find crystal signatures. There is some problems, challenges that occur when you have occluding particles, but it still does a pretty reasonable job because this tells people something about the crystallinity of the sample. Yes? 
So I used a rounded total variation. So uh, you know, sparsity of the gradient sort. I, I'll say sort of. So I, I like to use this regularizer, which is not as strong as a you know pure sparsity regularizer because that tells tends to, maybe for this it's okay, but in many cases it produces samples that are a little waxy looking. So I have a regularizer where I can control you know that a parameter, but it can be a, close to a total variation, which is just sparsity of the gradients of the image. So, so that, that ends you know, this part of the talk. It tells you that you can, by doing model-based methods, you can look at CT of materials which have crystal, single crystal domains. So your measurements are highly corrupted and they're extremely noisy. In the next set of slides, I'll just give you like one slide overviews of a bunch of other applications where we've again de designed techniques like this. It's not exactly this, but I'm not going to go into the details in the interest of time. So one application is called neutron laminography. So laminography is a variant of computer tomography, is that if you have samples which are very long and you want, to you want to do a CT scan like this, there are certain orientations in which nothing, the, the, the sample is so lengthy that it just blocks the beam. Nothing gets through it. So one trick people do is just tilt the sample and rotate it this way. And that's what laminography does. So this is, the idea of laminography is not new. But what we have done is you know, develop an algorithm that can deal with the low flux of neutrons. And there are other challenges that happen. You have a neutron-based system. There are these gamma that hit the detector. And just, you know, it, it corrupts the measurement by just these kind of spikes in the detector, which can happen. So that, makes, that adds an additional layer of complexity. And the geometry is not standard. right? So if you go to MATLAB's like iRadon, if any of you have done CT with MATLAB, there's, there is the basic function. You cannot just like plug something like this in. You need to design a new algorithm for it. So what you're seeing on the top is a data set collected of, a, of an additively manufactured part. What you're seeing there is actually tape. It's been taped to a, to, a, to a table of some sort. And neutrons are sensitive to those things. It's just like, you know. And you can see that. And these are reconstructed cross sections. So whenever I'm showing you a reconstruction from now on, we do 3D, but I'm showing you one cross section. And again, compared to the filtered back projection, these model-based approaches can significantly improve performance. And there are, if you look at the papers, you can go and look at zoomed in insects, which you know, show that we can find porosity. So the people who, are, who come to, who work with us are interested in finding these pores in, in the additively manufactured parts. So we showed them that we can do it better by designing a new algorithm and also improve the system performance, right? So the same data, different algorithm, huge difference in performance. Another application, and this, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is an col active collaboration we have with Purdue. Uh, and, and the student, Hani Al-Mansuri, has led this effort of doing ultrasound tomography. And so if you want to look inside, you, you know, for example, thick concrete walls. So an ultrasound system sends a signal, receives the, you know, bound, the received signal, the bounces, which are heard from a bunch of receivers. And you want to turn that into an image of the interior of the object. So you want to go, and again, we've developed a model-based technique. This, we have used linear models, so it's still a simple, a simple, a simple model, but it's still, it, it helps us produce a reconstruction quickly. So if an operator placing the instrument on a wall, they can quickly get some feedback. And compared, so what you're seeing here is the ground truth. A bunch of, we create, you know, at Oak Ridge, a, a, a few folks created a test structure with a bunch of known defects, and they then process the data using a standard technique, which is very fast, and using these model-based techniques, which is not as fast, but pretty close, but we can start seeing defects a lot more clearer with these model-based techniques. And again, you can refer to the paper. I just want to give you a flavor of uh, you know, uh, what was done. And the challenges was the new design of a forward projector. Actually, even the regularization was not just sparsity, but we had to tune it a little bit in order to account for the fact that ultrasound systems, as you go deeper, the resolution starts to drop. So we had, we had to come up with some compensation techniques for that. More recently, we've been looking at single particle cryo EM which is cryo-electron microscopy. This is a, a, a technique that is used to look at, for example, protein structures. It's a, you know, if, I don't know how many of you have heard of this technique, but the, the people who invented this technique got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. So cryo-EM is a technique where, again, you're doing tomography, but of, of particles at like atomic scale. So what they do is they essentially, at least you know, I, I can see the electrical engineering app, you know, explanation. You have an object you want to do a CT of, but you cannot control like how to orient it. It's just like it, the entire length is a, like a nanometer or something. So you have many repetitions of the same object put uh, in an ice. It's flash frozen. It randomly orients. You have replicas. You obtain a single image, and you go to the single image and pick pick each particle, 
assign it a certain orientation, do some pre-processing to clean it up. This is a very challenging application because the raw data is extremely noisy. It's like zero dB is a good measurement. So it's horrible signal to noise ratio. And the reason is, if you expose the biological sample to electrons for too long, it destroys it. So you are dose limited. And then they do a, a tomography. It's a well-known technique. There is an established pipeline, but they often involve pre-processing the data and then doing a tomography. So what we're looking at in this application is, can we go directly from here to the reconstruction? Can we go from raw measurements by modeling the, the, pro, the, forward pro, the, pro, the process of formation? And here we have demonstrated using some simulated data that we can. And that prop, the forward propagator not only includes random orientations, but also something called the contrast transfer function. So it's the propagation of the wave from so you have an incident beam on a particle, then you have a, a, a propagator uh, which creates the data. That's the model. You put that in, solve an optimization problem. And then again, at very low signal-to-noise ratios, if you just plug this data in into a standard algorithm, it's, going to, it, it, it's not designed to handle that. Whereas these model-based methods, by better modeling and having regularizers, can produce big improvements in quality. So this is the ground truth, because in this case, I simulated the data, right? So finally, I'll end with the last application, and then before, oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, you mentioned the, the W showed up before. I wasn't sure I could pick the weights. Ah, so that's a good question. So the W term here is a term, yeah, it can, you can use it as a statistical weighting term. So in this case, I've effectively used a, uh, you know, this to be in proportional to the variance of the noise. Inverse, inversely proportional. It's an inverse proportionality, right? So in this case, I've just used the count measurement. Okay. So it's like this approximation. So ideally, I think using a Poisson model would be the best thing. But in the interest of computational complexity for this application, we have just used. Uh, but going forward, you know, this is all just on simulation. But I think that would that is a very good question and the way to go in terms of improving these techniques. The counts are high enough, then you'll be fine with that right. But yeah, here we are really dealing with. Low, low, low mount. So there, there is, I think, value, but I, I think there's also an engineering thing about it. there are many other imperfections. So you know, when you use a Poisson model and everything else is perfect, you know, it's good. But if there are other imperfections, then introducing a Poisson model may not give the big improvements that it should, right? With the model mismatches. So that's another thing to think about. So finally, I'll end with we also have micro CT systems, right? So there are the lab buys or sometimes build some custom-made micro CT system, which is doing tomography with a cone beam system. You have an X-ray source. It's a standard. You can purchase some, or sometimes you have to build them. But I'll show you an interesting application where, these, where there was value to designing new algorithms. So uh, people are looking, who are making new nuclear fuel, they're looking at a fuel called a triso. So it's a, it, it, this is a single pellet of nuclear fuel, uh, of a nuclear fuel material. And they've done a CT of a single pellet. It's a very small pellet. And you can see at the center, what you're seeing is the raw data collected from a scanner. You can see that the center is really dark, which means there's no counts there. Can you guess why? Does anyone want to say? So I did a CT of, a, of an object, and they got almost nothing at the center. And I, can, I, I told you it's a nuclear fuel. It's all attenuated. It's all attenuated. At the center, this is, it's, it's a chemical, which is a, some compound of uranium. So it just densely attenuates. But they're interested in studying how these particles, you know, how they, how they are inside, to do CT of it. So it's really difficult to take this raw data and just get a good reconstruction out of it. And it's a, it's a layered particle. It has a core with a bunch of layers around it. So how do we get high quality reconstructions, CT reconstructions? If you, because if you use the standard techniques, because of the fact that these beams are so highly attenuated, you can start seeing a lot of streaking artifacts occur. Whereas with these model-based methods, with the regularization, we can get big improvements in performance. And they're often interested in these. Maybe the lighting is not the best for this image, but uh, they're interested in studying defects around the score. And so for these model-based techniques, you can start seeing big, you can start seeing some of these out, just outside this densely attenuating core. So where again, we're showing that th there's value in designing these model-based techniques for you know, real-world systems. And, and I'm skipping a lot of details because these are large volumes, and you know, there's a lot of things that go in to make this practical. Right? You're looking at a 2K by 2K by 2K reconstruction. You're looking at one picture out of a 2K cube volume. So I'm, not going to go into, I'm going to skip the details, as you saw, of the computational aspects of this. So 
In the next part, I'll just briefly highlight some work with convolutional dictionary regularizers. In the first part of the talk, we essentially looked at solving such optimization problems where really a lot of the novelty was in the design of the data fidelity and in the design of the subsequent optimization. So you're casting imaging as an optimization problem. So can we do better by going beyond the standard sparsity type models is the question we asked in this part. And I'll just give you, again, this, I'll just give you a very high level overview of this. We have been interested in a model called the convolutional sparse representation model. So it's a model for an image. It says that an image, a good, a good model for an image is it can be approximated as a convolution between a kernel and a coefficient map. And what you're seeing here is regions where this particular kernel is active. So by summing this up, you can get an image. This is the underlying signal model. So it's a, prop, it's a model convolution between a dictionary and a coefficient map which has the size of the image. So this is a, it's an old model which has gained a recent, lot of interest in recent times, partly because of all the convolutional neural network work. And so the question is how do we use such representations to improve tom tomographic reconstruction? So there is two problems associated with this. First, you, you, know, you don't know the dictionary for a stack of images. So that, that problem is called the convolutional dictionary learning. This is a well-studied problem. I, you know, I didn't come up with this, the algorithms to design it. But essentially, you learn the optimal, dic you know, good dictionaries by minimizing a function. So given a set of training images, you have for each training image, the representation, a convolution between the kernel and the coefficient map for that image. And then you often impose some sparsity on the coefficient map. And if you optimize this, you can learn good dictionaries for training images. And why, why this model? It's a global model compared to, pa instead of extracting patches from an image and learning, you take the entire image and learn. So that's one advantage. It's, it's translation invariant, and it's easy to incorporate, and there are fast learning algorithms. That's one of the reasons this field has got some interest. But the question is, how do we use this model to do tomography? And one of the problems is, so often, though I showed you this image, that this is what people do, in practice, when they want to learn a dictionary, people often are looking at images like that. So instead of that, they often split the image into low and high pass components and do the dictionary learning on the high pass component. So that makes it challenging to use when you start using it for other applications like tomography. So here are some, an example of just using it for something simple. You want to remove no additive white Gaussian noise from an image. So one way to use this convolutional sparse representation is to write out a cost function which is based on, minima you, know, you minimize a function with these terms. And you pre-process the image. So take the image, split it into low and high, take the noisy image and split it, and then you can solve this optimization problem and reconstruct the clean image. Another way of doing it is to say, okay, I'm not going to pre-process this image into low and high pass, but I'll, I'll estimate the low pass component as an additional term in the cost function, and I'll regularize it so that it's smooth. So this is an interesting approach, and it, you know, it's useful, but yet another approach is to use a weighting term, which is based on an empirical weighting scheme. So you Take the same cost function, you want to denoise an image, you split it into low and high pass, so you pre-process. But now, when you do solve the optimization problem, you use a weighting term for each of the coefficient maps. So really, at the end of the day, there has to be some way to smartly regularize the coefficient map, and that's what uh, this technique does. And the weights are chosen empirically based on an initial estimate of the image. So you have a noisy image, you estimate weights for each of these coefficient maps, by using a correlation between the learned dictionary and this noisy image in some way, and then you pre-process. So this technique is a little heuristic. So it takes, the, the algorithm is take a noisy image, you know, use it to compute some coefficient map, and then formulate a cost function. So it's not purely solving an optimization problem in some sense. But, and it, it turns out that this technique is pretty effective. So if you, here's an example of denoising. So I took a stack of images from this test data, learned a dictionary by pre-processing, and now I'm going to use this to denoise images which are not in the training set, but are from similar data sets. So here is the example of, you have a ground truth, you create a noisy image, and these are the three different algorithms to remove them using this convolutional sparse representation. So in the first technique, you pre-process uh, and reconstruct. And the second technique, you learn the background also simultaneously. And the third one, you do this empirical weighting scheme. And it turns out across experiments that this empirical technique actually gives a big boost in performance for these sparse representations. So the question is then how do you use this to do tomography? Because tomography is a much more complicated problem. And to do that, we're using this framework called the plug and play framework, which again, so you know, as I said, I think the second, a lot of imaging is based on solving optimization problems. So the plug and play method was inspired by looking at solving this using a technique called the alternating direction method of multipliers. And it essentially breaks down the problem, the, a single optimization, into a sequence of different optimization terms. 
The first step often involves an inversion. So you go from measurements to reconstruction, and there's more to it because you kind of regularize the, the answer. And the second step, you do a denoising, and then you update some variables. So this was inspired by the ADMM, but at the end of it, what we, what we, obs what we have observed is replacing the, the second term, which is actually just an image denoising, by any empirical denoiser still results in, a, in convergence in some sense to a fixed point. So this technique is a, in some way a, a very different way of thinking compared to just solving an optimization, especially when you start plugging in different denoisers. And we have shown that by plugging in the, and so therefore we have this empirical sort of denoiser and we can plug it in into this tomographic reconstruction using this approach. So instead of just solving an optimization, we use a plug and play style approach. I'm going to skip the details of what we did, but, but that's really the approach we looked at. So here are some ex results. So we took training data set. We, so if any of you are interested in training data sets, there's this thing called the Tomo Bank, which has a lot of training images from, uh, for, for tomography, really geared towards tomography, put together by folks at Argonne National Lab and others. So I, I took some, ex fan, some simulated examples from there, learned a dictionary, and used it to do CT of a part like this. So it's an object which is rotating. I simulated noisy CT data and reconstructed it using the techniques we saw in part one, which use simple sparsity-based regularizers. And this is using another technique called patch-based sparse coding. And this is the convolutional sparse coding with the plug-and-play approach. So at the center of the spoke, these spokes, you can see that the resolution can be significantly improved by using better regularizers than just pure sparsity, especially when you have noisy data. So it shows that model-based techniques can be improved further by the design of good image model. So if you have a model for your signal, I mean, this, of course, makes, I think it's, it makes sense in this sense, but then how do you do it was what this part of the talk was about. OK, so, so, so that kind of rounds up two parts. I'll just end with a few slides on some recent work we've been looking, uh, doing with deep learning for non-iterative reconstruction. So this is the process of just taking data, maybe applying some transform, and then feeding it to a, or to a deep neural network. There's a lot of work. I mean, we are by no means the only ones doing such things. There's a lot of interest in applying these or looking at these techniques for various applications, including for computational imaging. So this is work led by uh, Amir Ziabari, who's a postdoc in our group right now, and also Hani, who was there before. So I'll just show you some example images. So the idea is you want to get high quality reconstruction of CT parts. So you can do a simple algorithm. You can do the algorithms in, in the first part of the stock, model-based approaches, which are computationally expensive. And the goal is, can you get something reasonable by just learning the pairs of bad to good reconstruction, to high quality reconstruction? Simple method, complicated method, and the deep neural network in this case essentially acts like a surrogate. It's learning the, the inversion function in some sense, in, in, under the limited training set. Anyway, so one thing Amir has been leading is, how do you do it for 3D? How do you do it for large 2K volumes? And he's developed this network called the 2.5D deep learning network, which essentially learns by taking two 3D volumes, but not doing 3D learning. It takes just a few slices of an image from here, and then has a target reconstruction. So, and it turns out his, he has been showing that doing this is much faster than doing fully 3D networks. And the quality is pretty much the same. So you can, you can ref, look at his paper. And he's, we, I've been working with him on using this for additively manufactured parts. So here is an example of uh, the same jet engine turbine scan, part scanned in an X-ray CT system. And here is the standard filtered back projection, uh, uh, in this case, FDK, because it's cone beam system. You're looking at cross sections from a 3D object, okay? Using the stand, a simple algorithm, using the model-based method, which in this case, it's just an implementation, so I wouldn't take this number as like, you know, it's not the most optimized piece of code, but it still takes a lot of time. You get improvements in quality, but whereas if you use a, a deep network which has been trained to map from here to here, you can get the answer really fast for a, for a huge volume. You're looking at getting an answer in 45 or 50 seconds. Yeah, so this, the, the architecture, I think, is a pretty, like, it's the fully, the fully convolutional type, like, the network, and so that, that. No, 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 but this is, this is, a, but this is a standard network, in the sense that this is, like, the, this is a, so in denoising, they have this DNCNN, this is a very similar network to that. So, it's interesting, all this is, you know, the, the quality, you get high quality, potentially, but let's take a closer look, and maybe I have a word of caution as my last thing. 
right? So there are some other model mismatches that occur. So if you, let's look at some other cross sections. So this is FTK method one, fast method. It's noisy, these cross sections. With model-based methods, you can get much higher quality. And with this, we saw that the, it can get quality similar to this in terms of noise resolution. But we, can, we, started, we have observed cases where we do see some artifacts occur. So for example, you, you, can you see like this little thing here? This is not present in either of these images, right? And that is cause of concern. Because when you're looking at a part that you want to scan, you've got to be careful that the artifacts that are produced don't look like features in some way, right? So this is uh, something that we, we are still actively researching and looking at. But as, we, as many of us look at deep learning techniques, it's good to think about uh, how to deal you know, with these kind of cases and have thorough evaluations, especially when we have, like at Oak Ridge, we have a generic user facility with all kinds of things being scanned. It's much more unconstrained compared to a, you know, a scanner for human beings or some parts of your, like a brain scanner or something. How do you know this artifact is not from the Right, so that is something we have not, you know, I don't have an, a precise answer to that, but it, this was the input essentially to the network. The, you know, it was a 3D volume with slices with cross sections which look like that, right? So, and similarly, I mean, again, maybe over here, if you are, you are to come a little closer, we could start seeing some slight drops in intensity. So, these are things we're still investigating. So, if you're asking ourselves how, you know, how to, how to have some reliability metrics. Secondly, another interesting research topic in this area is how can we make it for a generic scanner? As, as I said, we're not building a medical CT scanner, right? We're having a scanner where people scan meat, pieces of meteors. They scan, as you saw, pellets of like nuclear fuel. There are, so there are all kinds of things being scanned. So how do you design algorithms? Or maybe you design for different categories, but that is an interesting topic. Uh, and we've, I'm not going to go show this much, but it, it, we have looked at similar techniques for ultrasound also. So where we again have like, uh, maybe a different, we have a different architecture, but essentially going, what I would say, non-iterative reconstruction. Going from measurements, transform them to a to a simple image quickly, and then have a neural network produce a high, re high quality reconstruction. And we have, I think some of the results are extremely promising in the sense that you can deal with nonlinear inverse problems and still produce. In this case, you're looking at ground truth and final reconstruction with the deep learning technique. So it can even improve upon some of these model-based techniques with simple models. But I think there's still, you know, I would still say these are preliminary results and there's you know, a lot of investigations to be done. Or maybe we have to use deep learning as Beck has been doing. On in, in an iterative fashion. So with that, I would like to conclude today's talk. What we talked about was computational imaging, improving imaging systems through algorithms. We looked at model-based methods, which are based on optimizing a cost function. We briefly looked at plug-and-play methods, which instead of minimizing a function, looked at, uh, looked at essentially, in some sense, finding an equilibrium solution to a set of constraints. And so you solve, opt solve this iteratively, and you arrive at a solution. So it's a different way of thinking compared to the first part. And we also briefly looked at some non-iterative deep learning solutions and looked at some challenges. So in summary, these are powerful approaches. When you're building an imaging system, giving atten you're paying attention to the kind of algorithm that you're using can produce dramatic improvements in system performance. And you can get higher quality information even from noisy, imperfect, you know, highly attenuating samples, various challenging scenarios, you can deal with them very effectively using these kind of techniques. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all my wonderful collaborators in ISML, my, my people on the experimental side also, uh, Brent Wolberg at Los Alamos, and the Purdue for the ultrasound project, Charlie Bauman and Haniel Mansouri. Thank you very much. <laughs>